Hello, friends, and welcome to Sleep Tight Stories. I'd like to say hello to Oren and Ethan in Yakima, Washington. Remember to always be kind and that you are loved. Hello to Moshi from Miami, Florida, who is seven years old. And hello to William Ashoka from Washington, D.C. Mommy, Daddy, and Allie love you more than you will ever know, and they are so proud of how you tackle hard things. Happy belated birthday to Salak. Happy fifth birthday, Mommy, Daddy, Tita, and Didi love you so, so much. Too many years to come. Happy belated birthday to Nora on Hornby Island, who turned seven on January 25th. Love Ella, Mom, Dad, Peppa, and Posey. They love you so. Happy belated birthday to Olivia Tully from Waukesha, Wisconsin, who turned eight on January 25th. You are a great kid, Olivia. Happy belated birthday to Forrest from Portland, Oregon, who had his birthday on January 28th. And happy belated birthday to Claire, who turned five on January 28th. Happy birthday to Joe from Cochrane, Alberta, who is turning eight on January 29th. Happy birthday to Sadie, who is turning nine on January 30th, from her mom, dad, and her little sister, Claire. Happy birthday to Helen Kuntz from Round Rock, Texas, who is turning seven on January 31st. You are a good kid who is deeply loved by your family. And happy birthday to Maya, who is turning six on February 2nd, Groundhog's Day. And to her brother, Avery Dog, who turned 14 years old around January 1st. Your mama loves this rest hour story time with both of you, more than you can imagine. In your next year, she will love to watch you continue to grow, being curious, imaginative, clever, and kind. Happy birthday, everyone. I hope you have a wonderful day. For shout-outs, birthday wishes, and a touch of extra gratitude, join us as a supporter. In addition to shout-outs, you'll enjoy exclusive stories and an ad-free listening experience. Find out more at sleeptightstories.org support. Thank you. Esther and Araya have made it across the bridge, only to find themselves trapped by Scalix and Chicolores. They cannot go back across the bridge, and the way forward is blocked by the creatures. The light from Esther's bag is glowing brighter and brighter. Can it help them to get out of this situation? The Magical Book of Dreams, Part 26 As the creatures continued to recoil at the sight of the bright light, time seemed to slow. This gave Esther time to take a breath, and Araya the ability to take up a better position to support her. Esther, almost automatically, she never thought of herself as courageous, reached into her bag and grasped the glowing book firmly in her hands. She wasn't thinking and was acting on instinct. Time seemed to return to normal and the creatures, still hesitating, watched as the light from the map enveloped Esther, casting a beautiful aura around her. She closed her eyes, focusing on the warmth and energy pulsing from the map, channeling the good magic that still resided within. Araya, stay close, Esther said, her voice steady despite the fear that threatened to paralyze her. Araya recognized the authority in Esther's tone and moved closer her eyes fixed on the shifting creatures, her body at the ready to take action. 
As Esther held the map out in front of her, the light intensified, growing in strength and brilliance. It began to pulse quickly, in rhythm with the racing heartbeats of Esther and Uriah, creating a blinding array of light and energy that filled the clearing. The Scalix and Chickalors, now visibly unsettled, started to back away, their growls diminishing into uncertain murmurs. Esther took a step forward, the light moving with her, and the creatures retreated further. It was as if the pure magic emanating from the map was a repellent to them. They despised the light, perhaps because it was a reminder of a world they no longer understood or belonged to. Keep going, Esther, Araya urged, her voice tinged with awe. You're doing it. You're driving them back. Encouraged by Araya's words and the retreat of the creatures, Esther continued to advance. The map's glow spread across the clearing, sweeping over the ground and bathing everything in its protective light. The Scalix and Chickalors, unable to withstand the intensity, turned and fled into the shadows, disappearing into the canyons. As the last of them vanished, the light from the map began to recede, dimming back to its normal glow. Esther let out a breath she didn't realize she had been holding, the tension easing from her shoulders. We did it, she whispered, a mix of relief and disbelief in her voice. Araya, smiling broadly, clapped Esther on the back. You did it, Esther. Your magic. It's just as the elders said it would be. It's incredible. With the path now clear and the creatures gone, they continued their journey, the book still glowing warmly in Esther's hands. They moved quickly, partly due to the fear that the Scalix and Chickalors might return, but also due to the energy they felt from the experience, their bodies still tingling with residual adrenaline. The path up the mountain was arduous, a constant upward climb that would test any but the most experienced climbers. Esther's thin little legs started protesting almost immediately. They walked in silence, with Esther still in the lead and Araya walking behind her. She would sometimes give her gentle nudges to encourage Esther. Other times, she would hang back to make sure they weren't being followed. The environment gradually transformed as they ascended. The mountain's lower slopes had once been covered in trees and sparse vegetation, with hardy shrubs and twisted trees clinging to the rocky soil. They were now largely transformed into the rock-like substance Esther encountered everywhere. On some parts of the ground, hardy grasses did manage to grow, appearing as they might have before, though their once bright green was muted by the constant gray. The air was cooler here, a welcome relief from the tension-filled clearing they had left behind. As they climbed higher, the vegetation thinned, giving way to rugged, exposed rock faces and steep gravelly paths. The trail wound its way up the mountain in a series of switchbacks, each turn offering a new view of the sprawling landscape below. The higher they climbed, the more the unknown realm stretched out beneath them a tapestry of stone, mist, and shadows, with pockets of the once vibrant land still visible in the distance. Esther and Araya pressed on, 
their pace steady but slowing as the climb became more challenging. The altitude also began to take its toll. Their breaths came in short, heavy gasps, and their legs ached with each step. Esther's legs were visibly shaking, which had not gone unnoticed by Araya, who would get Esther to take brief breaks with the excuse of needing to catch their breath and have the opportunity to admire the view. The summit was still far above them, a distant point against the sky. As the sun began to dip towards the horizon, casting long shadows across the mountainside, exhaustion finally set in. They found a relatively flat outcrop of rock with a clear view of the valley below and decided to rest. While Araya sat down with a hard thump, Esther no longer had control over her legs and simply fell. Esther crawled to the back of the space where they were resting and leaned back, feeling the cool, hard surface of the rock against her back. I didn't realize how much that encounter took out of me, she admitted, her voice quiet and weary. Araya nodded in agreement, pulling her knees up to her chest. It's not just the physical effort, she said. Battles like that drain you in ways you don't expect. But you were amazing, Esther. You are becoming everything we hoped you would be. Esther smiled faintly. I really didn't do anything. I didn't think it was completely unplanned. It was almost instinctual, just like when you catch yourself when you fall. You don't have time to think, you just react. Good magic flows through you, princess, Araya said, before taking a drink from her sack. They sat in silence for a moment, each lost in their thoughts, the quiet only broken by the soft whistling of the wind. The challenges they had faced together had forged a strong bond between them. Looking up at the path ahead, then back at the distance they had covered, Esther started rubbing her legs. We have a long way to go, yet have come so far. I will make these little legs of mine carry me up the side of the mountain. Araya met her gaze. We'll make it, she said, together. Here I sit. My legs feel like soft candy, out of breath, and you sit over there looking as healthy and vital as ever. I don't know how you do it, Esther said, looking at Araya with amazement. You haven't shared much of your life. How did you become so strong? Few in Shirewood that I have ever met could compete with you. There aren't many mountain climbers amongst us. Well, I am tired, believe me. Fear has an amazing way of wearing out your body. When I was younger, I had little choice but to get strong. It was either run or be run over by those annoying chickalors. Later, I was chosen to be a knight for reasons I am only now starting to understand, Araya said, as she ate more of the weird sticky food she had in her bag. We didn't have much in the way of activities, fun or running races like you might have in your realm. I can run and hike because if I didn't learn how, I wouldn't have been able to escape the creatures that chased us all. I remember you mentioning that, Esther said, trying to chew and swallow the food Araya had given her. It had a marvelous effect on her body, but it was really hard to eat. I didn't play much. I trained. Trained to be a knight. To be strong and fast. To be as fearless as I could, Araya said as she looked off into the distance as if she were watching herself train. Araya's face softened as she paused. Life back then, she began, her eyes distant, 
felt like being in a world where every corner was brushed with just a hint of magic. The realm wasn't entirely devoid of color and joy like it is now. In the mornings, I would wake up to the sunlight filtering through my window, casting patterns that danced with the remnants of Gimbel's magic. She smiled faintly, lost in her memories. In our garden, the flowers still bloomed, not as vibrantly as in the old tales, but enough to bring a splash of color. You could touch them and feel a faint tingling, a whisper of the magic that once was. The air had this subtle sweetness, especially during spring, as if the world was trying hard to remember its former glory. The marketplace was livelier then. There was fear, but people hid it well. The problems were farther away. The artifact's influence was slow in spreading. Merchants would sometimes bring in trinkets imbued with little charms. Nothing grand, just small enchantments. A locket that kept its shine. A wind chime that played a soft melody in the absence of wind. We held on to these pieces like precious secrets, a silent rebellion against the encroaching gray. Araya's expression turned somber, but even then, the change was palpable. The colors faded a bit more each day, and the laughter grew quieter. We all felt it, the magic withdrawing like a tide, slowly receding from the shore. That's when I knew I couldn't just watch it fade. I had to do something, even if it meant stepping into a realm that was becoming more unknown by the day. I lost my parents a short time later, and Gimbel then became like a father to me. But the elders are not gentle teachers, so I was pushed and pushed. Even then, they believed you would come and I have spent my whole life preparing for it. I'm sorry, Araya. We have lived such different lives. All the complaints I had living in Shirewood seemed so insignificant, Esther said, looking off into the distance. I almost wish I could go back. But for your father, Araya continued for her. Yes, but it seems more than that now. I will do my best to rescue my father, but I am starting to believe that I am a part of something bigger, and I am determined to do my part the best I can," Esther said as she rubbed her legs, trying to will them into action. You are a part of us and our struggle, Araya said, getting up to look at the sky, the route they had followed, and the way ahead. How are your legs? Esther tried to stand but struggled to do so. It was clear that her legs were worn out. They are sore, but I am sure I can continue, Esther said bravely, trying to hide the truth. I will follow you, Esther, but looking at the route forward, there isn't much in the way of shelter from here until the top and it's almost night. Walking up this path in darkness is not wise. The Scalix and Chicolor seem to have gone for now, and if they regain their courage, we will want to be physically ready. I suggest we rest. Esther tried to stand up, but failed. With a weak smile, she said, you are right. Let's sit, eat, and sleep. I'll tell you stories about the exciting life I had in Shirewood, and you will find yourself bored to sleep, Esther said, trying to get comfortable as she took out the last of the strange-tasting food that Araya had given to her. Araya, always on the lookout for threats, sat back down with her back to the wall. I look forward to the distraction, Princess.
And that is the end of this part. Good night. Sleep tight. <laughs>